Next, we're going to move into the panel discussion, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this session. So I'd like to call up um, my panelists, and as I call your name, could you please come up? So Della Adequad, President and Academic Dean, uh, Xinhua Kim Kimakong. Kim, Kim Are you here? <laughs> You're here, okay. Dr. Mike Degani, President and Vice Chancellor, Nisiping University. Um, Dr. Mike Gagne, are you here? <laughs> there he is, okay. Uh, Stephen Augustine, Associate Vice President, Indigenous Affairs and uh, Newcoming College, Cape Breton University, you're here. Excellent. Dr. Daniel Weeks, President and Vice Chancellor, University of Northern British Columbia. Looks like everybody's here. And Asma, are you here? You're here. Asma Vencia, President and Vice Chancellor, Algoma University. I should I get my papers back in order now. Welcome, everybody. Hi, have a seat. So this, this is an honor to be facilitating this morning's discussion with leaders from across the country who have partnered to make this year's form a reality. Once we have everybody ready and with uh, their mics, we'll start, start our panel. Welcome, Miigwech. Good morning. Are we ready? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. So this, um, let's get started. It's taking bold action. Come with us. It's quite the provocative topic. So to start, as this is the fifth annual forum, I'm interested in gathering your thoughts as leaders on the progress that has been made in terms of reconciliation across our country, and in particular, in particular, the university post-secondary sector leading up to today. Who'd like to start? Or do we want to? <laughs> yes, like there you go. You have your mic there. <laughs> OK, read the question one more time. So the question is, uh, what are your thoughts as leaders on the progress that has been made in terms of reconciliation across our country, in particular at universities, leading up to today? All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated what uh, Chief Bobby Joseph had to say this morning, as I always do. And we've worked together for many years. Uh, and. Um, um, I've learned a lot from you, so thank you very much for your words this morning. Um, we have um, we've talked about uh, a little earlier in the day about the notion that you know reconciliation has been discussed for many many decades, really, and and it has. And um, um, Isidore Day and I were just talking about how we've been talking about reconciliation for many many years, but it's just we've talked about it in a different way. We've talked about it using different words. And if you go back to the early 80s when um, Indigenous leadership in our country were talking about uh, the sobriety movement, we talked about uh, sober leadership and, uh, and how that was going to present a better face to, to Canada. And so that's really where a lot of that work started. And then we started to talk about the healing movement uh, and, uh, from residential schools, and, and that really was reconciliation work. And now we're talking about reconciliation more properly. And then I think in the future, we won't talk about reconciliation as much. I think the word will change to, to self-determination. And so in, in the, you know, if, if we look at um, some of the, uh, of, of the uh, I guess, bellwether or um, crossroads events that have occurred uh, around reconciliation in the last, uh, in the last decades, when we go back to 1967, 
when we were so proud to be celebrating our 100th, 100th birthday and Canada and Confederation, it was a very big deal. Um, indigenous people stood up and Chief Dan George on the West Coast gave a speech called the Lament for Confederation and he talked about how we have, as Indigenous people, have not uh, a lot to be proud of. That we uh, would like to be a part of Canada, but we are, are left out of it. And 25 years later, at Canada 125, George Erasmus gave a very similar speech, one of our great Indigenous leaders, and he said, you know, we still are on the edge of Canadian society. We still need to be let in. And he posed a question for all of us that I think is important for universities, and that is, he says, what are you afraid of? What, what are you afraid of? If we become equal to you and partners with you, why are you so fearful of that? Just recently, you know, uh, Canada 150, Justice Harry Laforme, also a very, a very senior Indigenous person in this country, and whose voice we listen to, said, um, we remain on the edges and the margins of Canadian society. So I think when we look at how far we've come, in, in many ways, um, you know, we have more kids in the universities, we have, you know, we're recruiting more kids, more, more p students are graduating, all of these things are good, but we haven't really changed what it is that we're doing. And so, um, if we move ahead to the next milestone, Canada 175, and we say to ourselves, what speech will be made at Canada 175? Will it be different from 100, 125, 150? What if it's not? What if one of our students mm -hmm. that's sitting in our class today, 23 years from now, as a great leader, stands up in this country and she says, nothing has changed. We're still waiting for reconciliation or some form of it. But there is an opportunity if we think about this and then we reframe the way we think and say, what if the speech was completely different? What if she looked back and said, 23 years ago, as a result of this conference or, or the work of universities, everything changed. Everything changed. And all the universities started to think about um, Indigenous people in a different way. And instead of saying, how can we attract Indigenous people into the, into the university, we were saying, how can we bring the university to the community? Or what if that student said, everything changed because when I came to the university, I was unprepared and they prepared me. And I was financially challenged and they removed all the financial barriers for me, all of them. And when I needed help, they helped me. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, when they, when, I, when, I, when they saw my excellence, they supported that. We can do this, but we need to think about 23, 24, 25 years from now and say, what can change today? And I think that the potential there is, is, is tremendous. Thank you very much. And who would like to jump in on this? You want me to jump? <laughs> okay, uh, for us at Cape Breton University, uh, we've been working aggressively with a strategic management plan, and we developed five milestones, five pillars, I'm sorry, milestones. I heard that word earlier. And one of the major ones that we focus on indigenous is Indigenize the Ulnu way, and Ulnu is the word that we use for ourselves as Mi'kmaq people. Mi'kmaq just happened to be another word that somebody else called us. Um, and we are all treaty people, building our, on our past and embracing new responsibilities. I'm sorry, I just uh, have to read a few things. Uh, uh, because I was at a sunrise ceremony this morning and it took us two hours to uh, bring the sun up. <coughs> uh, so one of the major strategies in, is engaging elders and knowledge keepers and embedding all new perspectives in the curriculum and campus traditions. So we have been trying to educate 
the President, senior management, the Board of Governors, and the Senate. And in terms of changing going forward, we don't want to do the same thing that Department of Indian Affairs has done by developing our reserves and band numbers and controlling indigenous peoples. So we, we're focusing on the other way around, inclusion and diversity, taking learning outside of the classrooms, in community learning, indigenous methods, ceremony and spirituality. Can you roll that video that I asked to ha have played? I've been collaborating with uh, immigrants, German, Syrian, Lebanese, Vietnamese, and uh, they've been anxious to learn about indigenous cultures and traditions, and they come to Canada, they said there's not even a question about indigenous people, about what they want to learn in Canada, about the indigenous. And what I'm saying is, we have to open the door to our tradition, spirituality, and ceremonies. Albert Lightning, way back, he said we have to show the young people who don't have opportunity to go to powwows and, and, and indigenous gatherings. We have to be able to give it to them, bring it to them. And so this is a presentation of myself. Uh, this is what an outside classroom should look like. And you see the world still around you, you are being created. So, you continue this process as long as you can open your eyes and see your world. So, Gizulk, that is that mysterious entity, uh, we give the word, we call it the Great Spirit or the Creator. It made everything. So, we say Gizulk, uh, number one. When I do ceremony, I always thank Gizulk, number one. I, I blow smoke, I do the smudge, and I offer the smoke from the smudge. And the smoke represents our collective prayers, your thoughts, your spirit, your, from your heart. Uh, but they're coming through me, and I'm sending them up to giver of life. โอ้กิโซกลาเลียกุจิตันเดซิตายิเดกะนิมัจุนิมัจวาอะมีวะเดเมกตันเดซิตายกิซิตุนเวลาเลียกุจิตันเดลีอะกิซินอะกวยเว
That's the kind of uh, environment that uh, we need to expose our people in Canadian society. Our own people lost their connection to our spirituality, and now we're trying to bring it back, and I think part of the reconciliation action that we need to do is to bring this kind of education to our people. Let them know about spirituality and ceremony. And let them know about how we are doing it in our own language. And these are the things that we inherit from, from our ancestors. And it's important for us to continue the process and to share it and to be more open about it. I know it's secret and sacred, but today we need to go out there again. The only way we were able to keep oral traditions and our stories alive was to share it far and wide. We didn't copyright it, we didn't limit it, and, and, and that way we spread it out so that everybody could know. Walalio, well, thank you. Oh, miigwech. And Della? Or ask? Um, Della and I have spoken, and, and yesterday we feel like we really did um, share where we're going in partnership um, and we're pleased to share that with others but we thought it would be important we've i think got about three two minutes three minutes left to have unbc share where they're going not a problem thank you well i'll only take 20 minutes of that two minutes then um, <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm i'm between you and lunch so i'm, I'm well aware of that uh, i i think uh, president daganya has captured it perfectly with the challenges that are ahead of us and and um you know, that beautiful presentation from Cape Breton, I think, honestly, we, we, many universities, if not all universities in Canada, have a story very similar to the great work that they're doing at their individual campuses. Um, my colleague, uh, Deanna Nice, is in the audience here. Uh, um, in partnership with, Deanna is the, the president of, a, of an educational facility uh, in the Nass Valley of uh, British Columbia, and in partnership with the Niska people, UMBC has been granting degrees in, in that facility for nearly 30 years. So as, as, as Mike has said, this is not new work. Um, and we all, and, and I think Paul Davidson this morning captured it perfectly, all the great work that's being done across the country. Um, but, but Paul also said, some of us are moving slowly and some of us are moving fast. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm a slow mover who wants to be fast. And every good thing that's happened to me in my life can be traced back to my experience in this place as a student. Every good thing. And I wear that, that, uh, I wear that every day. And so I, I don't feel like we have a lot of time in many ways. I, wanna, I would like to see a bit more of a moonshot to, to piggyback on top of the great work that's happening at CBU and, and every one of our institutions. Um, and I don't know what that moonshot is, but I think it's the idea for it is in this room. So how do we pull it out? How do we tease it out? How is it that in, that in Canada right now we have, um, you know, uh, super clusters, but we don't have a super cluster for Indigenous education? How is it that we, we, we put our energy behind uh, a new initiative in Canada around work-integrated learning in post-secondary education? 
Why can't we have an indigenous integrated learning in Canada? Exactly. The government recently announced, uh, I think, $145 million for uh, outbound international experiences for our students to other nations. Why can't those nations include our First Nations of Canada? So those are just ideas that we've kicked around on the back of a napkin. You know, and I think that's the moonshot that I'm looking for. I expect that we're all going to continue the great work that we do on our campuses, but I think we need something significant uh, as our, for our next five years to get to the place that Mike just talked about a few moments ago. Thank you. Della, I can see, has something she wants oh, to yeah. say. I'm going to talk really fast. I'm going to talk really, really fast. Um, First Nations University of Canada, of course, Oops. is that... Can you hear me? There. Okay, there we go. Um, in, t in terms of those clusters, the First Nations University of Canada or other ind Indigenous institutions across Canada have taken on the, the call to action in terms of, uh, historically, the... Indian control of Indian education, which, which was a response to the 69 white paper. And so, uh, Shangwak is a member of the Indigenous Institutes Consortium here in Ontario. And so, as we look across Canada, and I think this is where we have to engage in other post secondary institutions, and we have Wendy here uh, from IIC, but we also have other organizations or institutions and individuals that I would like you to meet. Some of them are, are, are on the way uh, back home, but one is Alison Pickerel, and she's, for me, the epitome of what you need to do in your institution in terms of benchmarking where your students are at, where you recruit them, and of course the whole student services that would be applicable to uh, the indigenous population. The other one that um, I'm hoping Liz Dorette is here as well, if she's in, wave your hand. But one of the uh, instrumental uh, success factors is um, the cross-cultural competencies within your organization, again, all, across all staff and faculty. Uh, and I think that is crucial to not only engage them, but to, you know, kind of do the navel gazing and understanding um, how they're delivering their programs to in, Indigenous students in particular. And I'm, I'm thinking the other one is having a champion within your organization. Again, someone like me, uh, who's Indigenous, who can um, bring that worldview perspective, but also champion all the goods and uh, services um, and in particular the support services, the indigenization of the organization uh, in terms of your programs and services, because you need a vetting process. Because uh, it's been my experience as well that sometimes the wrong information is being perpetuated uh, over, the, over the years and you're giving the wrong information to uh, your non-indigenous students. Um, and, and so I want to leave you with this one little mantra that was kind of rolling around in, uh, across the country. And it is nothing about us without us. And I think that's part of that inclusion, part of that dialogue that has to continue. Hi, hi. Uh, miigwech. Okay.